northern France. An English force, ragged and cut off, prepares to fight its way to safety. Blocking the way is the finest army medieval France has ever assembled. The French noblemen are confident of victory and feel nothing can stand against them. But this day in October 1415 will not be theirs. Six centuries later, experts are now examining what we really know about one of the most famous events of the Middle Ages, the Battle of Agincourt. The Agincourt is about bravery, but it's also about glory. Somewhere around here, there are thousands of the dead from the Battle of Agincourt. And find out how the day became the most terrible disaster the French nobility had ever known. They have no idea that they're actually fighting for their lives. The medieval world, the 5th to the 15th century. A team of archaeologists investigates medieval life by exploring the world of the medieval dead. We have a classic view of the storybook medieval life. We don't hear the stories about the common man trying to keep his family alive. In our stores there are hundreds if not thousands of skeletons. Archaeologically speaking, we can now focus in on the medieval dead people. You're looking for clues in the skeleton all the time. And you couldn't help almost look through their eyes thinking, what did they see? How did they die? This unlucky battle was fought between the villages of Azancourt and Richeville in the year of our Lord, 1450, on the day of St. Crispin and Crispinian. The battle on October the 25th, 1415, is perhaps the best known in English history. Agincourt, or Azancourt, was Henry V's great victory. It cemented the young king's reign and turned the tide of English fortunes in the Hundred Years' War against France. The story of Agincourt comes to us from several contemporary sources. Henry V had invaded France to recapture lands he believed were right for the English. His army besieged the port of Arfleur, but many of his men were struck down by dysentery. With weakened troops and the winter approaching, Henry turned north and headed for the English base at Calais. A huge French army now massed to cut off the English withdrawal. Some claim that as many as 40 or even 60,000 knights and men-at-arms stood against Henry V's army of a fraction of this number perhaps just five or six thousand. The confident French knights advanced to what they assumed would be certain glory. Thousands of armoured men charged forward across the narrow battlefield. Most of Henry's troops were archers, only lightly armoured if at all. Yet they were experts with one of the deadliest weapons of the medieval era, the longbow. The English archers rained down volley after volley of arrows on the French knights who fell into panic and chaos in the night. Where, trapped and helpless, they were either killed or captured in large numbers. It was the stock of legend and quickly formed the mythic fabric of an England with a newly emergent sense of nationhood. The Battle of Agincourt sums up what people perceive of the medieval period in terms of battles. It was supposed to be the classic one where the, the outnumbered few uh, managed to win and therefore it's, it's reached mythical proportions in terms of, you know, anything is possible. It was Henry V's victory, somehow winning through against all the odds. 
I think Agincourt is possibly in most people's minds the most famous medieval battle, especially in England, because it's reached mythical status thanks to William Shakespeare. It's the archetypal stereotypical battle. So there is the underdog, the English, that managed to win. And of course the nasty French are, are seen off the battlefield. And of course it suits the English frame of mind. This is, you know, anything is possible. And this is what happened in Agincourt in 1415. This is broadly the way Agincourt was viewed for many years, for centuries even. It wasn't until relatively recently that historians began looking into the real story. Professor Anne Curry is the world's leading expert on the documented sources relating to Agincourt. Her starting point was the size of the two armies present at the battle. The assumed view often taken is that the French had a huge army of tens of thousands of men, outnumbering the tiny English army. But few, if any, researchers have gone back to the existing records to verify this. Many of Henry V's army, famously, were archers, and began by looking for records of these men. The received wisdom was that we didn't know the names of the archers who were at the Battle of Agincourt. It was thought we knew the names of the men-at-arms because of what's known as the Agincourt Roll, which is an early 17th century transcript. I made it my mission to go to the National Archives to look at all of the original source materials. This was a paid army, so we had a lot of pay records in the Exchequer files, and made it my mission really to find out the names of the people on the campaign. The files revealed just how many men Henry V assembled for the campaign in France. England didn't have a standing army at this point. However, it had enough military activity to make it possible to be a professional soldier. For the Agincourt campaign, the army that set out to go uh, there, we know the names of at least 7,500 people of what was probably an army uh, over 11,000, perhaps nearly 12,000. Finding out exactly how many men were at the battle on the 25th of October 1415 is more difficult. Yet from Anne's work, it can be estimated that Henry's army possibly numbered around eight or 9,000, more than the smaller force of perhaps five or 6,000 suggested in the past. Also, it seems the French army was not quite as large as many have suggested. Looking at the French army is much more complicated than looking at the English army. We have some financial records, but we just don't have as, as, as much, because after all, the French are on the defensive and they would no doubt hope to have as many troops as they possibly uh, could raise, say from towns and things of that sort. But one very useful indication is the amount of money that they uh, were raising. We have one very important document where Charles VI ordered the raising of money to support an army of 9,000 men. That was going to be made up of 6,000 men-at-arms and 3,000 gens de tree. That could include longbowmen and uh, crossbowmen. You see immediately the reversal, if you like, of the English ratio. We've got two men-at-arms to every one archer effectively in the, the French army. So I believe that the idea was to have a 9,000 strong army. It would have added to that, so maybe we could get it up to about 12,000, but it's really hard to see how it could have, have been larger than that. These ideas of 40,000, 60,000 just are not credible in the light of French army sizes uh, in this period. But it would have been men-at-arms heavy, uh, and it would have been aristocratic, but I think you've got to remember the English army was also aristocratic. There really isn't that much difference. We have this idea of the English army being full of Tommies, if you like, being a popular army, and the French army being sort of, you know, of hooray Henrys. In fact, they socially, they are quite similar to each other. In terms of equipment, they are very similar to each other. Uh, and also, the thing that people forget too is the French have had to move huge distances too. Everybody misses that out. It's as if they've already you know, flown into Agincourt. Remember, they also are moving long distances. They would be weary. They would be running out of food as well. In late October 1415, the two armies, more evenly matched than was previously thought, were engaged in a pursuit through Picardy in northern France. Henry needed to get his troops back to English-controlled territory. 
It does seem that Henry, after taking Harfleur, decides that he will withdraw to Calais. All of the sources seem to agree on that. Uh, I don't think he was battle-seeking. He thought it would take eight days to get from Harfleur to Calais. Of course, it took a lot longer because they didn't dare cross the Somme. Crossing the River Somme would take time and leave an army vulnerable. The English had to try and stay one step ahead. The French army is sort of shadowing them on the other bank and therefore it takes a long time before they, the English can get ahead and get across the river. So I think we've got to say here that he is trying to get away and the French are trying to, to hound him. He is scared at that point to engage with the French. Karen Watts of Britain's Royal Armouries has studied the French army of the early 15th century. The French have got a totally different attitude with regard to this oncoming battle that they know is going to happen. They think they're going to a party. They think they're going to a, a grand tournament. There has actually been a tournament only 15 years earlier, a few miles away, called the Tournament of saint Ingelvert, in which the English and the French, during a truce in the Hundred Years' War, jousted together. And in fact, the French commander of Agincourt was one of the great tournament leaders of this tournament of saint Ingelvert 15 years earlier. So the French think they've come to a wonderful tournament dressed in their best armour, the latest gear. For many of the French nobility, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. They streamed toward Agincourt from all over northern France eager not to miss out on catching the fleeing English. The composition of the French army was different to the English. The French anticipated that the battle would be fought on foot between the men-at-arms on both sides and they reckoned they had the advantage in having larger numbers of men-at-arms. The French they do have a plan to send a group of cavalry against the archers to override the, the archers. They're trying to eliminate Henry's advantage, which is that he could loose arrows against the advancing French and try to damage as many of them before they engage, to knock them out before they can get to the English lines. It seems that the French did not have as large a cavalry group against the archers as they'd intended because the knights and gentry wanted to be in the melee. They didn't, they, they didn't see any glory in riding down archers. They're expecting a glorious amount of hand-to-hand -hand combat with the opposing English army and above all hoping to have hand-to-hand -hand combat with the English nobility and above all the English king. But this was unlike any tournament the French noblemen had experienced. In less than an hour or two, they, the flower of French chivalry is decimated. This comes as an utter shock and a surprise. Their own brothers, their fathers are dying before them. Earls, dukes, counts are all falling. And at this point, they're still trying to pretend that they are noble and chivalrous. And you find a number of the high nobility offering their gauntlets as surrender because they're expecting to be captured. If they surrender, they'll be captured, they'll be ransomed, they'll be all right. They're in no great danger. They're not going to actually die, not if they, they give themselves up. These French knights have completely misjudged and misunderstood the battle in which they find themselves. They have no idea that they're actually fighting for their lives. With a high proportion of nobles fighting in the front lines of both armies, many of the French killed were aristocrats. This was unusual for a medieval battle. Most of the dying was usually done by common soldiers. This has a massive consequence for immediate French history because there are no heirs and France becomes massively weakened and decimated and unable to provide male heirs for, I would say, 50 to almost 100. It has an effect to almost a century later, this one battle. 
Anne Curry believes the numbers involved have been exaggerated. At the time of the battle, France was a nation divided by civil war between the Burgundians and the Armagnacs. Contemporary accounts from both sides vary in their estimates of the numbers killed, probably for political reasons. Agincourt was a disaster for one party of the French. There were quite a number of Burgundian deaths. It is extremely difficult to know the actual number that died, but I don't think numbers like 5,800, which is put in the Burgundian Chronicles, those seem just as exaggerated as the, uh, the numbers of, of, of troops. Maybe, you know, one and a half thousand would be a, a, a reasonable figure, even for the English as well. I mean, some English sources imply, you know, it's sort of 10 people, others about 400 or whatever. So th perhaps of all the things we, all the difficulties we have with figures, the, the dead is going to be the most difficult one to know. Whatever the exact number, it was a very heavy defeat for the French. King Henry himself claimed God must have been with the English that day to punish the French. Churches and cathedrals across England bear tomb effigies and memorials to the veterans of Agincourt. In France, there are relatively few. On the field itself, there are no memorials dating back to the time of the battle. To this day, no one knows exactly where in these fields the last resting place is of the many Frenchmen who died here. It's this very absence of graves that drew Tim Sutherland's attention. He's an archaeologist and battlefield specialist. He's best known for his work at another medieval battlefield, Towton in Yorkshire, Northern England. Agincourt is a much more widely known and written about battle than Towton. So when he became involved here, Tim expected his research to be relatively straightforward. We're going into an environment where we think we know everything. It's a classic story, Shakespeare's covered it. Every historian of name who deals with military history has covered Agincourt. And so we went in there thinking it was going to be a piece of cake. He had no idea that he'd embarked on an investigation that would last for more than a decade. At Towton, Tim oversaw the excavation of a mass grave following its accidental discovery. He knew such grave pits also had to exist here at Agincourt. But before he could excavate them, he had to try to find them. In 2002, he and metal detector expert Simon Richardson carried out a major survey of the supposed battle area. They found and plotted a range of finds but found almost nothing medieval, nor anything relating to 1415. Tim was frustrated, but he was hooked. In 2007, he and Simon returned. This time, the idea was to target the area around a calvary, or calvaire, near the centre of the battlefield. From his research, Tim found that the 19th century monument commemorated a local family but also that it happened to be on the site where many of the French dead from 1415 were traditionally thought to have been buried. When we first came here, we did some primary metal detecting surveys across the whole length of the battlefield, but also we targeted the area around the Calvaire where we were now standing, primarily because we weren't initially allowed to do any archaeological work inside the, uh, the area of the enclosure at, at all. As part of the archaeological survey, the geophysical survey, we started to find lumps and bumps, geophysical anomalies. But just outside the Calvary here, there was a very large metal anomaly buried quite deeply below the surface of the soil. And of course that means that we targeted as an area of potential excavation. The anomaly seemed to indicate a large amount of buried ferrous material. Tim had only found small artefacts and no armour at Towton, though he was fully aware of the mass graves at Visby in Gotland, where many men had been buried still wearing their armour. It was rare to find armour, but could it happen again here at Agincourt? Accounts suggest Henry V had some of the armour from the defeated French buried or burned to save it from the enemy. The problem was that we didn't know what this metal anomaly was. It was a huge ferrous 
blob on an archaeological geophysical survey. And it was it had to be investigated because we knew it was very deeply buried. And of course there are all sorts of rumours about uh, Henry V burying pits full of arms and arms that he'd collected from the French. So in the back of your mind you think, is this possibly it? It's a huge hole and it contains a large amount of ferrous or iron material. So of course we had to go and target it and excavate it. We finally excavated a large hole, deeper, deeper, it got down to about three feet deep and then we were metal detecting as we went and then just be beyond the depth of a spade this fer ferrous metal anomaly turned up on the metal detector. We thought this is it, whatever it is, it could be an unexploded bomb, it could be a buried tractor, it could be absolutely anything. And then we slowly uncovered it and it was a pipe from a drilling rig that was fractured off and was deeply buried right in the ground underneath our feet. And it didn't make any sense at all. A steel pipe, maybe extending down for hundreds of feet, had created a huge ferrous signature. One, we were very deflated. And two, we didn't know what it was. And then of course we talked to the landowners and then one of them came over and said, ah, I remember that in the 1960s they were drilling here for oil and nobody told us and everybody had forgotten. And so that answered one of the questions about what the geophysical survey anomaly was. Then somehow, out of the disappointment, came opportunity. Now that had a knock-on effect because everybody felt so sorry for us that, that, that finally the, the, the landowner allowed us to do some archaeological excavation inside the Calvary enclosure itself. It was too good a chance to miss and normally wouldn't have been possible. Tim knew that this site was chosen for the Calvary because it had previously been the site of a chapel which might have been built in commemoration of the 1415 graves. It was destroyed during the French Revolution, but Tim wondered if traces of it might still exist and possibly provide clues to the lost graves. In the height of summer, this is almost impenetrable. So the first thing we had to do is clear the whole enclosure. So we strimmed it all out and cut it all back. And then we started to do a geophysical survey Straight away they found evidence of war, but not of the kind they were expecting. Just below the surface, or sometimes lying on the surface, there was a series of metal artefacts. And some of them were First World War bullets, and some of them were Second World War bullets. And there were badges and coins and all sorts of things. And basically people have been using this enclosure for whatever reason over the last 50, 100 years through both the First and Second World Wars. So of course people have been coming to this enclosure and also visiting it because it's an archaeological site of interest. And it all focuses on this cross here. Investigating this area, trying to understand it, is very important in terms of what, how it fits into the landscape of the battle. The Calvaire had seen a lot of history, but so far none of it seemed to relate to 1415. Undaunted, they recorded the surface finds and began to dig. We started off by putting a large trench across the entranceway because when we first walked in here there was some stones evident and protruding above the ground. And in that trench we found a series of stones and bricks with some lead casting in it which obviously held the railings. And so it looked like it was an entranceway to something that had a, a metal gate in it. Subsequently we found a postcard that actually still shows a photograph of the gate in situ, which was nice. We tried to date it and unfortunately it was built of the same bricks that the chapel would have been built of in the 18th century. And so we couldn't really date it. So finding that photograph was quite nice in that it looked more of a, a you know, 19th century gateway. And therefore they just used old build materials that were probably lying around the site. Encouraged by the 18th century remains, they kept digging, expecting at any moment to find the medieval graves. But again, it wasn't so simple. Every place we put a test pit within the enclosure here, we came down onto almost pure soil. And there was nothing in it, a few fragments of brick, and very little else. There's certainly no archeological evidence of human remains or large pits that ever contained human remains within this enclosure. Now that's very strange because everybody thought it did. And so, we have this anomaly. Where are the French dead from Agincourt? 
Tim had to search for other evidence, other clues in the history of this area that might open up a new line of inquiry. It's then that he found that someone else had been there before him. All this time, he'd been walking in the footsteps of another archaeologist, and possibly the first ever battlefield archaeologist. In 1818, Lieutenant Colonel John Woodford was a British officer serving with the Army of Occupation following the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo. With a lifelong interest in history, Woodford took the opportunity when stationed nearby to carry out his own investigations on the site of this famous battlefield. The only person we know who's archaeologically excavated in this area is John George Woodford. And that was in 1818, and he came along after the Battle of Waterloo with a troop of men, about 60 apparently, and he carried out some archaeological excavations, and he found mass graves. And in the mass graves there were gold coins, there were arrowheads, fragments of iron that he described and drew, and, uh, and obviously related to the Battle of Agincourt. And these were the dead from the Battle of Agincourt. Now, of course, what the problem is now is we don't know where he excavated. The excavation site has long since been lost. After all, hardly any record existed that it had ever taken place. The artefacts that Woodford found have, it seems, also been lost. In England, Tim follows the trail to find out more. No one before him has tried to put all these pieces together. At Warwickshire's county archive, he's found some vital clues. He's been drawn here by a series of letters in a collection that belonged to the Newdigate family. Somehow, this included a series of letters that Woodford wrote during his excavations at Agincourt. The Newdigate collection from which this comes from is uh, one of our biggest collections. Oh, right. The, the Newdigates would have known you know, a lot of families. They were quite an important family. And clearly, I think they were a family that were very interested in, in history and culture and art, right. which yes. may have explained their interest in this material. They probably would have been interested so, to, 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 to see the letters relating to Agincourt. Yes, certainly. So. So obviously, yes, these uh, before, before and after the time he's at Agincourt. He was quite prolific in writing to his brother, and yes. so uh, they were very close. Yes. So of course, obviously, he was, uh, he's conveying the excitement of the finds Absolutely. Uh, to his brother, and he's, he calls him my dear A, which is right. like he was a Alexander. <clears throat> and so he was saying, you know, what he's been finding, etc., etc. So there's, there's his name, yeah. John George Woodford, yeah, to, to yeah. A, my dearest A. Yeah. Yeah. June the 19th. Yeah, so he's writing, he's writing to his brother the day after the battle. 400 years after Agincourt, in 1815, Lieutenant Colonel Woodford and his brother Major Alexander Woodford survived the greatest battle of their own times, Waterloo. If you survived the Battle of Waterloo, yes, uh, yes. one of the first things you do is you write home and tell well, your parents absolutely. and your brother and everybody yes, else yeah. that, uh, that you are OK. But it's the Agincourt letters from three years later in 1818 that Tim wants to see. They're the records of the only other excavation at the battlefield, describing the only known finds to have been made, including the gold ecu. So this is one of the Woodford letters. Yes. This is the one that I'm quite interested in because the sketch of the coin here, and this was one of the coins that uh, George Woodford found during the excavations at Agincourt. Right. So this gold coin that Woodford is describing here on the uh, February the 20th, 1818, this is while he's undertaking the excavations at Agincourt. And he's writing to his brother, and he's done a little, quite a nice little Very sketch. Very detailed sketch, it is. actually, yeah. And then this coin went on to have its own life and disappear into a, an archive of another stately home. Now, as far as I know, these two drawings are the only record of what uh, Woodford found in during his excavations. Mm. It's a primary document. It's yes. an archaeological document mm. as well now because these sketches that tells you exactly the size, the I size assume, and shape. Yeah. And so this is all we now have of any of the information that's related to Woodford's excavations in 1818. Mm. And everything else, the exact description of how he found it, where he found it, it's all gone. It remains a mystery. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is what I've been chasing, and this is yeah. it's really nice to see this in the flesh, so yes. to speak. Obviously, he's taken a lot of time over it. Mm. And he was very, obviously very proud of it because he says in Absolutely, the letter yeah. 
that uh, you won't believe my luck, I found several gold coins. Yeah. With these letters, we're, we're, we're honing in, we're homing in on the, uh, on the detail that Woodford was providing. Yeah. I mean, he was making quite detailed notes and diaries and things. And that's what we do as archaeologists today. Woodford's dig at Agincourt caused controversy among some French locals for what they saw was the despoiling of the graves. The letters show, though, that his intention was always to give the bones a proper reburial. Now, the French say that uh, Woodford was ordered to leave by the Duke of Wellington, but we know that Wellington asks him quite politely, please, you know, you're making a f too much of a fuss, please leave the, the, the area. Rather frustratingly, there's no scale on this. No, it, it and so he, re he says <laughs> he's a bit he, limiting, he, isn't it? I have ordered an oaken sarcophagus. Yeah for the bones. Yes. Now is that, is that this big or yes. is it a proper sarcophagus? Is it a coffin sized? One would suggest it's slightly larger. The word sarcophagus yeah. suggests a proper burial uh, container. Yeah. This has provided the design and the dimensions yes. elsewhere, hasn't it? I and he's, he's he's not he's I have <coughs> cleared it with the mayor and curie to deposit them in Agincourt Church Yard. Mm -hmm. So he's even cleared it with the uh, with the church and yeah. said, right, basically, can I rebury them in the churchyard? And he's saying, and they're saying yes. So he's he's doing right by everybody mm. as much as he can do. And then we get to hear later from the French that this this box that Woodford has had ordered is then the bones are finally collected, put in this box, and then buried in the churchyard nice. in the correct place. But this isn't the general story that is available. The no. general story is he was a bit of a baddie. Yes. And uh, he was, uh, he was uh, obviously slighting the French name and the mm. French character and leaving it's bones here, there and it, everywhere. It? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's pure French spin. Now we know, because of this letter, that it was, it was Woodford that instigated this. Right. And the French have always claimed that they did it. Right. He was going to have a stone memorial, a piece of marble made with a date, uh, 1415 on it. Uh, something very simply says so that it's not glorifying, you know, either side. Yes. Uh, just as a simple memorial. Yes. And then he, sa he says all this, and he's writing to his brother, and his brother was very religious. Right. So he's not going to lie to him blatantly. No. He might have no. embellished the truth a little bit, but basically he's telling him what he was planning to planning do. To do. Uh, so this is, again, this is an important document because it gives one person's view, and obviously he's dead, and his opinion has been slurred. Uh, you know, slighted and yes. <laughs> almost, you know, distorted beyond recognition. Yeah. But having the primary document saying what his thoughts were to his own brother is fantastic, I think. Yeah. Tim believes the letters aren't the only thing that Woodford may have left behind. There is an excavation diary that goes with this. Right. Explaining in great detail how he did the work at Agincourt, yes. what he dug up, what he found, how he recorded it and where it all went to, yeah. including more annotated sketches. And of course that diary, the excavation diary, is, it's missing unfortunately. Yeah. The diary that you're referring to isn't, isn't there, there because, because he would have kept that himself. He or the family has That's kept right. that. And so this is the, the <coughs> detective side of the story and it's unravelling the truth. Mm. And this is why I like it because I like the facts. As an archaeologist, mm. I like looking at the facts. And the facts are he's done a nice little drawing. He's got the, uh, the drawing of the coin, the mm. arrowhead. Mm. He's trying to make good what he's doing by recording it. And that's as archaeologists, that, that's all we do today. We take yeah. photographs, record it. And, uh, and because we're, we're destroying the primary evidence. Mm. So seeing the primary evidence from 1818 is fascinating, but it still doesn't get us any closer to where, <laughs> to where this diary is. Tim then finds a clue as to what could have happened to the missing diary, relating to when the items from the collection were placed in storage in London. Somebody's made a note, and this is much later, Yes. and it says, Sir John Woodford, re, digging field of Agincourt, all he found lost in the burning of the Pantechnican. The Pantechnican was the original storage house. That's where we get the name Pantechnican van from. Pan oh. um, and that was the name of the Pantechnican was a, the original storage house in London. And apparently it all burnt down. And it was like a, a bazaar. It was uh, not only a storage place, but obviously like people bought and sold. It's like an antiques trading sort of place right. almost. And this may, starts to make sense now, but somebody's actually qualified this and why they put it on here I don't know because these letters survive mm. one of the gold coins survives so everything wasn't lost no clearly not so whenever the archive went into the Pantechnican it must have already been 
uh, separated. Yeah. Well, this material was sent to his brother, wasn't yes. it? So this may have been separate That's from right. the other. And, but the coin survived as well. Yeah. So that wasn't sent to the patent technician no. either. So there, <coughs> there are things that survived. So did the diary? Did the diary get burnt well. in the pan then? No, mm. but oh. well, that would explain it its would, absence. It would, it would, wouldn't it? Yeah. And so it might not exist anymore, and along with many of the other artifacts. So maybe that's a simple explanation about where everything's gone to, mm -hmm. including the reference to the gold rings. Yes. Uh, that'd be terrible. So maybe it's gone forever. Woodford's diary may be missing, but he did also produce a sketch map of the battlefield. It's very accurate to the roads and terrain, displaying all his skill as a former staff officer to the Duke of Wellington. Woodford plotted the French and English armies, but where did he find his information on their dispositions? It prompts Tim to check out all the known references that Woodford could have used. Anne Curry may be able to help clear up some of the confusion surrounding what we know or think we know about Agincourt. The earliest map Tim can find that shows Agincourt battlefield is the Cassini map from the 18th century, almost 400 years after the battle. Right from the start, there are problems with this. What we need to look at are the original sources of the map, the, the cartographic evidence, because of course we've got 400 years where there are no yeah, maps whatsoever. In which case, if we look at the first map, and obviously that's the Cassini map from the mid 18th mm -hmm. century, yeah. The only representation of the battle on that is as one of the sword symbols. The Cassini map only refers to the approximate location of the battlefield. Through her research, Anne could find no diagram or plan of the actual engagement itself until well into the 19th century. So what this, I believe, is the first printed attempt to plan the battle. And this was in Harris Nicholas's History of the Battle of Agincourt, the second edition of 1832. It's a bit problematic because it seems to be the wrong way round. It seems to put Agincourt on the right-hand side. The battle is shown on the west of the village of Agincourt. So is this wrong? Well, nobody else has ever followed it up, have No, they? it does Well, although there are elements of this in other maps. All the later maps from the mid-19th century almost to the present day seem to have used this as their inspiration before adding their own individual details. A lot of these are artistic representations of what people are thinking about at the time. But there are very few maps that show it like that. I mean, the tradition as it developed in the 19th century shows it in the traditional positions with the woods, Agincourt to the, the west, Trumcourt to the east. If all the later maps follow Harris Nichols' 1832 map, then where did Harris Nichols get his information? Only one detailed battle map is known to have existed before 1832. Well, this is the earliest map that we know of, and it's also one of the most accurate. And this is the one that was drawn by Woodford in 1818. Woodford has superimposed his interpretation of the battle in this, on this map. And of course, what we have is now the standard format of what we would recognise as the Battle of Agincourt. We don't know whether that influenced, say, Nicholas's diagram exactly, in yeah, that's uh, 1832. The only problem from the study of Agincourt point of view is that all of the things Woodford has marked on here are in his own mind. They're yeah. no more reliable than the chronicle texts. Exactly. Woodford probably based his own interpretation on the texts that were available to him at the time in the early 19th century. Many of the chronicles that are now standard references for Agincourt weren't translated until Anne's work in the 1990s. The chronicles of Raphael Hollinshead were in most gentlemen's libraries, so uh, I think that's, that's where he got the information from. So it's not until we find the physical evidence of, of this battle 
so with numbers of arrowheads, numbers of artefacts, numbers of whatever it is, even numbers of bodies and bones, in a specific place can we target this area and say, right, this is part of the battlefield? I know that it is. Until then, to be honest, Agincourt only exists in our minds, really, from reading this and yes, from looking at these maps. It, it's still an interpretation, and mm. an interpretation only exists in the mind until you find something to, so. to tie it to. Yeah. It will never be known exactly how many French soldiers died. Most of them probably still lie in the fields near here, somewhere. The mass of French infantry made a perfect target. Hundreds, thousands of English archers bent their backs and loosed their bows, unleashing an arrow storm. Henry V knew full well that the longbow in the hands of trained English archers was the weapon to be most feared in the battlefields of the Hundred Years' War. He would have known the effectiveness of arrow, uh, an arrow storm or of use of arrows in a punctuated fashion as well and he was wounded in the face by an arrow at the Battle of Shrewsbury. The English king was unlikely to have forgotten the painful experience of having the arrow removed over several days. I think it's realised just how useful those troops are because they're terribly versatile. We're seeing them at Agincourt in a perfect situation for the arrow storm, but they have many other uses uh, also. As I say, they have a use in the melee too. With their last arrows loosed, the English archers would have joined the men-at-arms in the final pell-mell assault on the beleaguered French. Back in France, Tim now goes in search of a few of them. There's one last place he wants to look. Tim knows Woodford found some of the Agincourt dead, but exactly how many is unknown, until the excavation diary is perhaps one day rediscovered. Yet what happened to the bones Woodford found? In the years after the dig, there were French claims that Woodford planned to use them to celebrate an English triumph at Agincourt. Tim's research has shown that this was not the case. What we need to do is we need to find this date inscribed on the wall of the church. It's 1838. This marks the location, according to a certain document, that of where the human remains were buried in the churchyard that Woodford excavated from the, from the mass graves. It's potentially the end of a long line of investigations. It's, we've been tracking Woodford, we've been tracking his excavations, we've been attempting to find out where his excavations took place and then of course these are the human remains that were found in the grave and then they were transposed from the battlefield, transposed down onto the village, into the churchyard. I've never looked for this date and I've never looked at the piece of ground. We'll go to the, the chapel and we'll see if we can find this date somewhere on the wall of the church. John George Woodford who in his 90s was the last British officer who'd served at Waterloo to die, perhaps knew something of what it meant to have experienced the most terrible battle of an era. He intended to rebury the bones with simple dignity. Tim Sutherland is the only other archaeologist to have searched for the Agincourt graves. So almost 200 years on, it's fitting that he's here now to look for the last piece of the puzzle. It's closely associated with a window, so it should be easy enough to find, but it's not there. It's not not on that one. I presume it was some, they were, they were marking the walls to make some sort of recognition of it, so they could recognise the spot again. And here's a blocked up and there it is. There's the 18, 38. That's the spot, according to the story, that's the place where the human remains were buried and it's not it's not a large area so and it's also part of the path going through past this window so presumably it's a small 
amount of human remains. It's not going to be a huge casket. So um, it's interesting. And maybe they're still there. I presume they are still there. So after all that wait in the grave until 1818, and then they come out of the grave and they're collected together and finally make their way into consecrated ground in this churchyard in the village of Agincourt. And they never quite made it into the specially built memorial chapel to the battle. It's quite sad in a way. But at least we found it. I think that's important. July the 27th, 1361, on the Isle of Gotland. Before the fortified walls of a great city, a militia awaits an invading enemy. They're all that lies between survival or destruction at the hands of a ruthless foe, professional soldiers and hired mercenaries. Who were these people, and what made them fight and die together? More than 600 years later, an international group of archaeologists is attempting to find out more. They'll investigate some of the finds from the largest mass grave from a medieval battle ever found. If you win or lose a battle, it's a momentous occasion for either the victors or the losers. They'll try to shed light on the men who wore this armour and fought this battle. Well, that's a foot that's been cut off. That is incredible. How they made their last stand and paid the ultimate sacrifice. The medieval world, the 5th to the 15th century. A team of archaeologists investigates medieval life by exploring the world of the medieval dead. We have a classic view of the storybook medieval life. We don't hear the stories about the common man trying to keep his family alive. In our stores, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of skeletons. Archaeologically speaking, we can now focus in on the medieval dead people. You're looking for clues in the skeleton all the time. And you couldn't help almost look through their eyes thinking, what did they see? How did they die? Houses have been put to the torch, grieving people stricken by the sword. Like a dog, he harries with a sword, and Gotland is conquered by the Danes. The words of inscriptions found hidden in churches and monasteries of Gotland from 1361. Bitter words by a beaten people. The Swedish Isle of Gotland in the Baltic Sea has been free of war for 200 years. Yet in the centuries before, its history was anything but bloodless. In the Middle Ages, Gotland was the richest city in the Baltic. It was a hub for seafaring trade and commerce dating back to Viking times. There are more hordes of coins and treasure found here than anywhere else. The middle years of the 1300s were a golden age for Gotland, most of all for its glittering capital, Visby. No wonder then that this rich island drew envious eyes from across the Baltic. 1361 proved a pivotal year for Visby and the Gotlanders. A 
as archaeologists, we're really interested in these periods of transition. And there is nothing that displays one of these transitions better than a battle or a conflict. Because usually there is an outcome that's very decisive. And that period of transition is not large scale. It can be down to hours, minutes, days or whatever. But it's certainly not years. And if you find the mass grave of a people who were killed during that conflict, that's perfect because that is the moment when the transition took place. So you can find out what happened before, what happened afterwards, and this is the point where it took off. And this is just a catalyst on this island. And because it's an island, it's a very small, insular sort of activity, but it has repercussions across the whole of the Baltic, basically. The events of 1361 in Gotland captivate medieval historians and archaeologists. The story comes to us from different sources. Few Gotlanders were left alive to tell the tale. King Valdemar IV of Denmark invaded the island with a large army of Danish and German mercenary troops. The Gotlanders, without a standing army, formed a militia to try and stop them, but they were pushed back to Visby. It was not an even contest, yet the militia stood their ground. The Gotlanders were annihilated by the professional Danish and German soldiers. The island was stripped of its riches and never again flourished as it had done in past centuries. It was the end of the Golden Age. The story might have remained nearly forgotten in the history books, were it not for a chance discovery more than five and a half centuries later. In 1905, a large grave was discovered outside the old town of Bisbee, traditionally the site of the Gotlander's last stand, commemorated by a great stone cross. In the grave were hundreds of skeletons. In 1928, three more pits were found with hundreds more. The Visby mass graves were a worldwide sensation, among the most important finds ever made in medieval archaeology. The finds were extraordinary, more than 1,100 complete skeletons. I think Visby, you could quite easily say it's unique. It's an assemblage of human remains that were discovered in the early 20th century that, uh, of people that died during battle. It's mind-blowing, really, in terms of the evidence you can acquire from a grave such as that. I can't think of another example where people were buried in their armour. Finding the people that died in battle in mass graves with their arms and armour is phenomenally rare. It's, in fact, it's virtually unique. When I first came across this assemblage and I first heard about the Battle of Visby, I thought that, obviously, it's just another battlefield mass grave. And so when I first saw the information that was compiled in the early 20th century. And there were plates of armour on the skeleton itself. And you think, this is unbelievable. It's so unusual. And the mind races to try to work out so many questions. Why were they buried like this? What sort of armour was it? How effective was it? Uh, what were the people like? But, but as, as an assemblage, it's so important. And it really makes your mind race. And it, it builds up a picture of what presumably happened on that day. The events of 1361 caused a deep scar that took generations to heal. Even now, it casts a shadow down the centuries. This is why historians and researchers, today more than 80 years after the last excavations, are compelled to revisit the story. Tim Sutherland has come to Gotland to add what he can to the ongoing research into the events of 1361. He's a specialist in medieval archaeology, particularly battlefield archaeology. In 1996, he excavated the mass grave from the medieval Battle of Towton in northern England. Now he's hoping to put that experience to use here. The grave site is a few hundred metres from the walls of Visby. The battlefield itself has long since been destroyed by modern development. But it's likely this area was chosen as a burial place because there was a monastery here at the time of the battle. 
and it would have been close enough to drag or carry large numbers of dead. He'll carry out a survey of the site where the mass graves were excavated to establish exactly where the pits were. They haven't been touched since they were backfilled after the original excavations. The good thing about this area is it contains the monuments, not only the medieval monument of the, uh, the stone cross, but we've got a modern monument of the wooden cross which stands in the centre of the church. The graves are under the pavement, they're under the road, they're under the grass, they're even under this garden and the house next to us. And so the interesting thing is, how much of any part of this can we see? We've already got the grid laid out. I'm just going to extend it by a metre, maybe two metres, run some lines just up there, and then we can just get going. Working with Tim is Dr Helen Goodchild of the University of York. She's a specialist in remote sensing, including ground-penetrating radar. The radar may be able to show the graves, although there's no way of knowing just how much the site has been disturbed over the past 80 years. We can survey through the pavement and hopefully get evidence of the mass graves. Then we want to just move slowly across the grass, getting more data as we move towards the cross. Hopefully we'll see evidence of at least one or two of these graves. But that's the challenge here. Can we see any evidence of the archaeological remains that, are, that exist here from the Battle of Visby? Back in 1928, Swedish archaeologist Bengt Tordeman began his own survey by looking for the area that had been excavated in 1905. He not only found this, but also three more mass graves. The dig had to expand to an unprecedented scale to recover all the material. Yet after almost a year, there was still one entire grave left unexcavated. This grave, Grave 4, is believed to be at the edge of the site, still down there, untouched. The reason they stopped excavating is that they just had too many bodies. They had three existing graves which were all full, some of which had chain mail, quaffs, gauntlets, shirts, and there were even some plate armour in there as well. And so by the time they'd excavated one, two, three graves, they came across grave four and they thought, there's no need to excavate this. And so luckily for us, they left it in place. What seemed as though it would be a straightforward survey hasn't been as easy as they thought. All under the field are the buried ruins of the old monastery. It started out quite traumatic in that there are big thorn bushes in the way. There are lots and lots of undulations in the ground. We thought it was a very flat green piece of grass and it's covered in lumps, bumps and also um, stone walls. So the radar was bouncing up all over them. So although it was very hard work and we've only covered a relatively small, air, a small area, the, the, the results seem to be really good. The experience has left him with a strong respect for the archaeologists who surveyed this site more than 80 years ago. You can't help but admire the people in the past because they had very basic equipment, theodolites, tape measures, uh, and a spade and a trowel, and yet they came up with so much quality data, and we should look back at these people with reverence and say, actually, they were very, very good at what they did. And we can learn a lot from them because they accumulated very good data, but at a very basic level. And we now follow in their footsteps and say, can we improve on what they've done. And sometimes it's quite difficult actually because it's just such good work that they've done. They plot the results and see if any of the archaeology can be seen. Now, although this is uh, still grass and house and gardens, we can see what they found. So we can use this to interpret our data. As Tim had feared, there's a lot of modern interference. The problem is we've got several hundred years of archaeology, including very, very modern features. When they strip this away, they can see the medieval archaeology. So we've got where the graves were, where the railings were, where the cross still is, and all the water pipes and anything else they encountered. So anything that's shaded there is where they've excavated. Now, although this is uh, still 
grass and house and gardens, we can see what they found. The empty pits left after Tordem and excavated them show up clearly. Grave one, right in the road. Grave two, half in the road. Grave three, almost under part of the railing. One grave would have been dug first. And they've successfully verified grave four, completely unexcavated, under the pavement. And then grave four, this is the one that was never fully excavated. It still exists in its primary form, about a metre below the surface. Then Tim sees something else they weren't expecting. So we've got this strange anomaly there, which we think may be something like a pit. The good news is nobody's excavated there. It doesn't look like modern interference. Could it be from 1361? That's interesting. That looks more ar archaeological. It looks like an archaeological pit. Grave 4 alone might contain many more skeletons and armour. And now Tim and Helen's survey has found another possible grave to be investigated. Future excavations will benefit from Tim and Helen's work. On July the 22nd, 1361, Valdemar's invasion force landed some 15 miles to the south of Visby, at Vastagarn, where the bay forms a natural harbour. Then they headed north. The Gotland militia fought at least one battle to try and head off the invaders, but they were beaten back. The militia fell back to the only fortified town on the island, Visby. Yet the great gates were closed to them. The Visbians would not allow them inside the city wall. Despite their protests, they were left to take their chances and face the invaders, their backs to the wall. The scene was set for their brave but ill-fated last stand at Visby. The Visby defences were strong enough to hold out. Why did they not let the Gothlanders in? The ring wall is a symbol of the city. Today it's protected as Visby is a World Heritage Site. But in 1361, for the militia outside the gates, the ring wall meant the difference between life and death. Gotham was in the middle of the Baltic, which made it very rich, because uh, you can trade from the east to the west and from the west to the east. And um, the Gotlander people were good traders. Visby was one of the trading hotspots of the Baltic, with waterfront warehouses, whitewashed buildings, and a safe harbour. It was a stone town, a medieval Manhattan, with high white buildings and you have lots of churches inside the Visby, and you have this uh, uh, ring wall. It must just be astonishing to, to come to Visby. These were prosperous times. People of many different nationalities came here, drawn by a city built for trading. Visby was very cosmopolitan, and there were it was an international town with many different uh, people here. There were Germans, there were Russians, there were Englishmen, and there were Gotlanders trading side by side in the town. So when the invasion came, why didn't they open up to the Gotlanders? We think that the Gotlander people wanted help from Visby, but Visby town decided to negotiate instead. And maybe that's why they don't open the gates to let the Gotlander people in. Maybe they were afraid to to get an army into their town. So then they let the peasants die just outside the, the wall. The Great Ring Wall was not just built for defense against overseas invaders. There was tension between the Gotlandic farmers and the Visby officials who controlled trade on the island. The wall was built to get the farmers to pay to get into the, the trading in Visby because the people in Visby want to, wanted to have their the trading center for, for themselves and make them their own money. A city wall to force the indigenous farmers to pay to enter and sell their goods at market. 
Such was the schism that existed between the islanders and the Visbian merchants. Why did they choose to fight this day? Uh, they must have known that they should be killed, probably all of them. They're just staying there with a wall behind you and a well-trained mercenary army just coming towards you. That makes no sense that, that they still wanted to, to fight this army, and, and, and they did. In late spring 1361, the Gotlanders received warning that an invasion was imminent. They had to work fast. With no formal army, they had just weeks to raise the militia, to train and to armour up. The Danish army inflicted a terrible defeat on the Gotlanders, yet little is known about exactly what happened during the final battle. Yet thanks to the excavations, there is physical evidence for what happened. Visby is unique in archaeology because many of the Gotlanders went to the grave still wearing the armour that they'd fought and died in. It's this armour that Karen Watts of Britain's Royal Armouries has come to see. It's here in Stockholm that most of the armour is stored. Karen has spent her entire career studying European arms and armour. And again, as with Tim, Visby is one of the reasons she became passionate about the subject. This is the best armour I've ever seen. It's just wonderful. The most iconic items among the Visby collection are the body armours. Any kind of armour from this time in the Middle Ages is extremely rare. Here, though, there's a whole range of armours, all worn in battle together, then buried at the same time. It's an unparalleled insight into how medieval soldiers faced battle. It's the only armour excavated from a battle anywhere in the world, ever. The types of armours are known as coat of plates and lamella. They're made up of individually forged pieces of iron, riveted or wired together, as part of a leather or textile harness. With several complete armours together, it's possible for Karen to see how each was tailored to suit individual combatants. I can't believe the size! Look, it's for a, it's for a boy! These actually, I have never realised that they're different sizes. Thomas Neyman is a serving Swedish army officer. He studied all the 1361 armours, painstakingly reconstructed here after they were recovered from the mass graves. Tordeman identified a number of types at different stages of development. Is it four different types of armors? Yeah. So you can see it evolving in this yeah. different material Absolutely. From, from these pits. If you look up here, what we see here is a different layers of textile that's been metallized. So now it's metal. Oh, yes, I see. And what I counted to so far is uh, three layers. But it could be more, but we have to do more research. The most common armours are the coat of plates type. A kind of medieval flak jacket. All of these armours are purely functional. They are fighting military equipment with no adornment or ornamentation except for this one, because this one has got brass plaques. It's there as a purely an example of a heraldic display. And have you identified to whom this belongs? That's one of the interesting things. It's a lot of theories on what it could be. Yeah. One of the theories is that it could be a family down in Flandern. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Gorda, but uh, we actually don't know because it could be because it's uh, one person missing from that family. Some of the skeletons had the remains of male armor still on them, such as these hoods or quaffs. It's rare enough to find single male links from most medieval battle sites, so entire shirts and quaffs like these are extremely unusual. One of the key mysteries surrounding the burials 
is why so much armour was left on the bodies and not first stripped. Various explanations have been put forward, such as the hot weather at the time of the battle, the risk of disease, or just that there were too many bodies to bury and too few left alive to do the job. In the first mass grave, you, you can see how they've been neatly buried uh, side by side, but uh, in the end they are just thrown into the pit with everything, and you even find coins and knives and quite valuable items as well. So they have been in a hurry for their last days. It must have been a horrible experience to, to get all those bodies in, into the pits. Why on earth would you bury these people with all that's very, very expensive uh, equipment with them? And there are all sorts of potential uh, answers. One of the answers is that basically there was no time to strip them, which is a bit vague. Um, down to the, the extreme possibility that you couldn't actually get the armour off them. If it's uh, the heat of the day, all the bodies have been left for a few days uh, in, a, in an intense heat and they all start bloating, you wouldn't be able to get the chain mail off them. It's as simple as that. And so you would probably have to start butchering the bodies to get the, the mail off them and the armour. In which case, are they prepared to do this? The bodies are hot, stinking and festered and, and of course, you might think it's not that valuable, and so you bury it. Uh, the good news about burying somebody in their armour in a place that's marked by a large cross is that you can come back in five years, or one year, or whatever, and you can come and take them off skeletons rather than off uh, fleshed bodies. And so that's the one, the one thing that makes more sense, is that they were going to come back for these bodies, and they never did. Metal was an expensive commodity. But what if the armour was obsolete? Could that be why they left it and didn't come back? An armour was very valuable. So we think that they put the armours in the mass graves because it was hot, you had to, to get rid of it quite fast. Uh, but also that the equipment was old. Some of the armours, the plate armours, are still modern uh, at this time. But some of them are more Viking style, and then it's really old. Another reason might be that access to the burials may have been restricted by the conquerors. This also suggests that they weren't, possibly weren't allowed to. They weren't allowed to strip the dead. And it was only the victors that were allowed access to all this. Now, if they had enough equipment and they didn't particularly want to uh, bother themselves by stripping all the dead, they might not have allowed anybody else to do it. Remember, this is armour and there were weapons. And so it could be that they wanted to hide the armour anyway to stop the Gotlanders getting access to it. So what better way than burying it? And it's a way of getting rid of a potential problem in the future. The coat of plates and lamellar armours were transitional systems. By 1361, these were being superseded by more sophisticated full plate armour for most professional men at arms. Like the Danish and German mercenaries the Gotlanders were up against. As everybody thinks these things are amazingly archaic and, and old fashioned, but mm. they're leading towards what is going to be the solid breastplate. Yeah, exactly. And people who are having to wear, wear body protection need something that is flexible, something that you can yeah. run in, something that yeah. you can move in. But a rigid body protection is an advantage over male. Male is flexible, it's yeah, very exactly. good, it protects you against sword cuts, but it doesn't protect you from heavy percussive blows yeah, if exactly. you're hit with a heavy blunt instrument. They know that male is good because it's very flexible, but they want plate. And they spend 150 years trying to evolve plate. This is a massive technological improvement when you can shape large plates. The Visby collection is very important. It's almost the missing link in the evolution of European medieval armour. In terms of technology, in terms of whoever designed this one, mm. this one is on the right track. This is the one that is going to evolve into yeah. the final armour. All of these are showing invention as showing the desire to find the yeah. perfect armour. The well-equipped Danish men-at-arms and professional German mercenaries of Valdemar's army probably took anything of value left over after the battle. 
especially items that were easily removed, like helmets, of which none has ever been found at Visby. So weapons and uh, helmets you are taken care of. And they are quite easy to take off. And, and you can also reuse the material, the iron itself. It, it's good even if the helmet is old or damaged. I think it was old and it was um, messy, sitting to those skulls that were smashed into pieces. But what of the remains of the Gotlanders themselves? What evidence still lies in their bones? Marlin Holst is an osteoarchaeologist, a specialist in skeletal remains. She's come to Stockholm to see for herself a selection of some of the bones from Visby. She wants to find out more about the collection, how the bones were classified and conserved. I don't normally approach the medieval period as a touchy-feely romantic thing. I just try to be scientific about it and try to see what's there and take what's there as fact and then interpret from there. When I do analyse medieval skeletons, I do see their daily lives from their bones and also from the context they were found in. And in the medieval period, you don't normally have grave goods, but you might see markers on their bones that suggest certain activities or fractures of certain bones or particular wear on the teeth that give a clue about their daily lives. Marlin's osteological work has involved in-depth study of the only other mass grave from a medieval battlefield at Towton, with around a hundred skeletons. Here in the stores at Stockholm's Historical Museum, there are more than ten times the number of skeletons recovered from Towton. We visually analyse the skeleton, so we determine the age, the sex, the living height and any diseases the person suffered from or any injuries they suffered from. It's usually not possible to tell the cause of death. Osteoarchaeology works very much together with archaeology and it's very, very important for us to work together and to communicate with each other because if I just study a skeleton, it only tells me a limited amount of information. But if I then put it into the archaeological context and see what the grave was like, what the site was like, what the general areas like that the individual came from, then I understand much, much more about the individual. The excavations were very meticulous for the time uh, to take care of all the skeletons because uh, they had a great interest in the military history and all the cuts on the bones were very interesting to them. Right. But we uh, have another interest in the bones because we w want to learn more about the people. Yeah. Osteology was a relatively new science. Peter Ackerson has studied the skeletons for much of his professional life, probably more than anyone else. He's looked at the ways in which techniques of analysis in the 1930s differed from current 21st century osteology. Due to the sheer amount of material, little work has been done on them since they were excavated the best part of a century ago. Since then, methods and attitudes not to mention technology, have changed. Well, this is also an example of how, how the skeletons have become mixed. Yeah. So this is a box with crania and tibia yeah. and one femur. The bones were not kept together in their individual skeletons. Archaeological methods were different in Tordemans' time. The site was gridded and excavated strictly square by square. If there were bones from one skeleton, they marked them so they could see each skeleton. Today, the accepted method is to excavate each individual skeleton completely, one at a time, keeping all the bones together in context. What isn't of use to contemporary means of analysis might still be useful in the future 
if the whole skeleton is stored together. In some cases you have all the thigh bones in boxes, in one box and the other bones in other boxes. So it, uh, our work was a bit tedious trying to figure out which pieces belong to which skeleton. The sheer number of skeletons makes it very time consuming to conserve them. Petter and other osteologists have spent many hours placing back together the Visby skeletons. Some haven't been looked at since they were packed away for storage. Yet it gives a unique cross-section of the types of wounds sustained in a medieval battle. Almost every skeleton has some evidence of trauma. Tordeman's analysis was the first step towards revealing more about the individuals in the mass graves. His work paved the way for modern osteology. The evidence is in the bones. To be able to give them something back, hopefully, we'll probably never be able to give them their name back, but what you could say is, right, this person was of a certain height, of a certain stature, of a certain robusticity, and they looked like they, you know, they did some honest, hard grafting, and, and they suffered in life like they had a broken limb or a broken finger, and you can see all this on the skeletal remains. All these skeletons that now remain of these people, uh, they need to tell their story, and I try to uh, be their voice. To be able to see them through their eyes and say, right, fair enough, this, this is how they lived their life, until eventually one day they died, for whatever reason, whether it was young or old, whether it was alone, or whether it was with a family and friends, that you could have died in a battle and you would have been tossed into a, a mass grave with l very l large amounts of people, and completely anonymously, and that's where they stayed. And to be able to see their life almost through their eyes, I think is very important. Because I've been told by soldiers serving today that one of their dreads is to die anonymously, unknown, and then be buried with nobody knowing where they are, who they were, and what it's all about, how they died. And so, to, certain, to a certain degree, archaeologists can help an individual from a long time ago have some sort of saying, you know, in the future. You know, this is who I was, this is what I did, this is how I lived my life and potentially this is how I died. It's all, always difficult to say in a battle situation uh, where do the, the injuries uh, hit the body. You, you, I mean, it's uh, in the turmoil of the battle you can get a, a blow from, from any part from any distance and you don't really know. They had no chance because they, the invaders were so much better at fighting and more experienced. The most common wounds are from bladed weapons, most likely swords. As he worked his way through hundreds of skeletons, Petter found blade trauma on many of them. And uh, you often see this just multiple cuts on each bone uh -huh. and just this one is uh, is interesting as well since it's from not an adult actually no it's it's just fusing yeah, so yeah. Fusing. how old would you say 17 18 yes so I mean, yeah. yeah that's very interesting and this it's also the inside of the shin so how do you think why do you think there are so many cut marks on a on a shin bone were they on a horse maybe or no, I think these uh, were the Gotlandic peasants mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, Danish army knew that uh, probably <coughs> the people they were about to kill they didn't have that much protection on their bone, on their legs. Oh, right. So uh, <coughs> they just aimed low oh, right. and cut and cut and cut. S to, to disable them? Yeah, exactly. But there must be about six cuts yeah. on here. And we often see that five, six, seven cuts. Really? Yeah. And are, are they generally can concentrated on the legs, all on the lower legs? Or? Mostly on the lower legs, but there also are some wounds on the thigh bones. Oh but yes. then we see that it's on, on the lower part of them. What, sure. what, what is this? Is this a cut mark to Yes. Foot? Well, that's a foot that's been cut off. That is incredible. So it's the, the lower legs, uh, the bones of the lower leg here. Yes. That have been cut off. And they've literally been sliced in, in half. Yes. And there are many examples of, of 
uh, feet being chopped off. Yes. And sometimes both feet with just one blow. That's incredible. So the Danish army must have had very good weapons. Very oh yes, sharp. and uh, the right technique. Yes. It seems that it was a deliberate strategy to chop off, uh, well, chop at the legs actually. Yes. So here we have a cut. Yes, and here you can see that there's almost uh, like markings that uh, you can see that the sword or whatever weapon was used was dented. Oh, right. So that you see these lines. Yes. So you think that's due to a damaged sword? Uh, yes, I think so. Otherwise, when you see the cuts, they're always really, really clean and yeah. smooth. Yeah. Yeah. But this one has this this like a pattern again it's a, another injury down here isn't it and the the bone was cut down and then the rest broke off the uh -huh. yeah, yeah the the end bit so the whole leg was cut in half Petter has found that many of the Gotlanders suffered injuries like this more than a third of the shin bones have cut marks on them and not only one cut on many of them. The Danish army have hit the Gotlandic farmers many times on the lower parts of their legs. Why were these injuries so frequent? Thomas helps them investigate. All, almost all the cuts um, are to the lower legs and they're so low down. So how would you deliver that sort of blow? Yeah, now I'm not going to be too vivid, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, with the range of the sword, you can easily hit the lower part of the bone. Without yeah. bending down? Yeah. But while you're doing that, you might be getting attacked by Petter's sword. Yeah. So you're making yourself more vulnerable. Yeah, exactly. And therefore you have a shield. If you don't have a shield, just hold him and then cut, uh, cut to the lower bone. Oh, right. Yeah. But you need to be pretty brave to... Yeah, sure. And also experience. Yeah, but if you have training, for example, if you're a farmer, perhaps you don't have a sword, yeah. you have a spear, yeah, then right. you can take hold of the spear and hold it and then make the cut. All right. And then it's no worries yeah. for you. And Petter was saying that sometimes both legs were cut as if in one blow. Is that possible with the yes, sword? Yes, it's possible. I think so. Not because I have done it, but yeah. uh, it's uh, so sharp, so I think so. To make a cut like that, you don't need that much force. But there are some, like this one here, this is the foot. Yeah. So where the leg has been cut through from the inside. Yeah, exactly. And the whole heel, and th there are lots of muscles here. Yeah. And, and it has uh, sort of glanced yeah. during the, yeah. the, the blow as well. Yeah. And I, that I think is pretty natural when you do the cut, because uh, See, without uh, cutting Petter here, when you when you come from above and make the cut, when the the length of the arm stops, it it bends oh, right. easier. Yeah. yeah. So that it could be sense. natural in the cut that oh, it actually right. bends because of the yeah. the range of the arm. Yeah. If you uh, look at what kind of armor the peasants uh, of Gotland will have, it will probably protect the upper body right. and the head. And if you're not trained, it's hard to uh, protect the legs. The most important first thing is to get the, the opponent down on the ground. And then they could have been finished yeah, off. Yeah, exactly. With the Cut them in the legs, hammer. get them down on the ground, and then finish them off. Yeah. It's very effective to, to take the legs off because you won't fight more and uh, you will scream more. And if you hear your brother screaming next to you, uh, you won't fight that good anymore. Many of the skulls have rhomboidal trauma marks. Some of these may have been caused by crossbow bolts, but most were probably due to war hammers. The Danish army used these weapons with hideous efficiency, probably to finish off men already wounded by the swords.
sometimes when you pick up a crania with a big hole in it, you just put it down and had to go and take some coffee and take a break for a while. It disturbs you what people can do to each other. And here's an interesting one. So it's the top oh. of the skull with some kind of arrow in it. Oh. And you can see that the arrow has struck him right in the middle of the forehead. Mm -hmm. And that must have been fatal, mustn't it? I mean, I oh, yes. can imagine. This is right oh. into the yeah. brain. Among the militia were the old, the infirm, the young, even the physically disabled, buried in outdated armour that wasn't even worth salvaging from the corpses. Why were these people left to face the Danish army with its trained knights and professional mercenaries? They had to go out and fight against this uh, well-trained army and they didn't know what to expect, but they were all just slaughtered. Despite the terrible suffering evidenced in the bones, there is also the truth that the Gotlanders fought and died in a brave yet hopeless last stand. Families, fathers, brothers and sons who died trying to protect their homes and loved ones. If you win or lose a battle, it's a momentous occasion for either the victors or the losers. And when this happens on a national scale, it means that massive changes take place across a whole country, maybe even a whole continent. And so when you see evidence of a battle, you can pick out what was happening to each side. And these people in the graves, presumably most of them, are the losers. The, the fact that Gotlanders lost and the Danes won means that there now is a, a sea change across the whole of that island. And the Gotlanders, who were phenomenally wealthy people, suddenly are ruled by somebody uh, from a, an external country. The physical remains in Stockholm and Visby serve as lasting monuments to the heroism and tragedy of 1361. The Gotlanders themselves and the grey walls that denied them safety. A frostbitten moor in northern England. Palm Sunday. Yet that's not why thousands of men now make their silent prayers. They know what is to come. Through the swirling snow, they will fight and bleed and die in one of the savagest days in the entire blood-soaked history of Britain. The year is 1461, and the Battle of Towton has begun. A team of archaeologists has spent years finding out what happened to the victims of this terrible day. Chivalry certainly didn't exist. A battlefield is like a multiple murder scene. Now they're attempting to discover how King Richard III himself laid memory to the fallen that indicates that it's absolutely of that time. And see what remains of the chapel he created in tribute to the men who died for the House of York in the Wars of the Roses. We have a classic view of the storybook medieval life. We don't hear the stories about the common man trying to keep his family alive. In our stores there are hundreds if not thousands of skeletons. Archaeologically speaking we can now focus in on the medieval dead people. You're looking for clues in the skeleton all the time. And you couldn't help almost look through their eyes thinking, what did they see? How did they die? So followed a day of much slaying between the two sides. And for a long time, no one knew to which side to give the victory. So furious was the battle, and so great the killing. So wrote a contemporary 15th century chronicler. The Battle of Towton 
on Palm Sunday, March the 29th, 1461, was one of the largest ever fought on English soil, and almost certainly the bloodiest. It left a scar that took generations to heal. The legend of Towton is left to us by the chroniclers. Some 60,000 men from the rival houses of York and Lancaster fought there. It was the culmination of years of dynastic conflict for the English throne, known as the Wars of the Roses. The bitter hand-to-hand -hand fighting lasted many hours in freezing conditions until the Yorkists won a crushing victory. As night fell, 28,000 men lay dead or dying. When, almost five centuries later, the remains of some of the dead were discovered in the Yorkshire soil, it was clear just how terrible that day in March 1461 had been. I think the only time I've ever imagined what it was really like in the medieval world was when I found that mass grave full of soldiers. And it was so obvious, it was so apparent how much these people had suffered that as I was literally troweling away at these people, you just could not help but thinking, good grief, these people suffered so much. That was not a good way to die. The victory at Towton brought Edward IV to the throne and ensured Yorkist dominance for many years until the wheel turned once more and the dynasty was brought to an end in 1485 with the defeat of Edward's brother and successor, Richard III. Whatever else the reputation of England's most controversial monarch, it seems Richard never forgot the sacrifice so many made on the battlefield that saw his brother become king. Nothing remains on the surface now to mark the battle. The stone cross is a 20th century addition, yet Richard III himself is said to have been in no doubt as to how important Towton was to his family's cause. It meant a lot to Richard III because his brother was made king here. Now this was the place where the Yorkist dynasty formulated all their ideas and their hopes and wishes and became the kings of England. They were the Edward IV, Richard III, and so this place was everything to them. On becoming king, Richard immediately set about commemorating the sacrifice of the Yorkist soldiers. Richard wanted to put this in stone. He wanted to build a memorial chapel. And in the village of Towton, he did that. He raised this lovely, apparently gorgeous chapel, very sumptuous, it's, it's said. Yet of this sumptuous chapel, it seems there's now no trace. It's one of the greatest riddles of the whole Towton story. One of the remaining mysteries about the Battle of Towton is connected with the Memorial Chapel. The trouble is, we don't know where it is. For such a grand structure that meant so much to the Yorkist dynasty, how can it disappear completely? And that's one of the things we needed to find out. Where had the chapel gone to? Archaeologist Tim Sutherland is determined to solve this centuries-old mystery. He's been linked with the story of Towton for almost two decades. It all began in 1996, when he was called in after developers working at Towton Hall made a grisly discovery. We were very fortunate in Towton in that when the building was being replaced, they dug new foundations and they dug deep enough to actually uncover human remains. The builders had discovered the last resting place of some of the Towton dead the only mass grave from a medieval battle yet found in Britain. These things are incredibly rare. A lot of mass graves are buried very deeply under the soil. Usually they're buried in places where they are not going to be disturbed. There were approximately 50 skeletons in the grave, each one a snapshot of life from half a millennium ago. 
Time was limited. There were just five days in which to carry out an excavation. A team of archaeologists from the University of Bradford was called in, including Tim Sutherland. Those skeletons really brought home what a, what a rough life it was. And you could see by the physique of the people, they were really robust people. They were very strong and of course you had to be. They were working on the land. They were doing physical, hard manual labour a lot of the time. They were tough, tough people compared to us. These people had been killed fighting or had been caught up in a fight. So they had evidence of extensive trauma, the head wounds and the wounds to the body. The weapons, the, the arrowheads, for example, still exist and still lie in the soil. Working with Tim to help find these traces in the Towton soil was metal detector expert Simon Richardson. A metal detector is a perfect tool. Um, it's the eyes under the ground, if you like. Simon has decades of experience in metal detecting, and he works alongside archaeologists, adding an extra layer to remote sensing surveys. I know the archaeologists have their um, GFAs and the magnetometers, um, but the metal detector for me goes one step further. I can find my new objects, things like arrowheads, coins. I can cover a lot of ground fast, where it could take archaeologists weeks, months, even years uh, to find the artefacts, to find things I can find with my metal detector. And then I will complement their survey uh, once they started digging. Simon had already spent many years developing his skill on all kinds of sites, including medieval battlefields. If you're on a medieval site, you never quite know what's going to, going to come up next. Um, and it can be absolutely thrilling. Over the years, Simon has found a wide array of artefacts from Towton, each one carefully GPS logged. This is the sword shape. It would have gone on the end of a, a leather scabbard from a medieval sword. It has like um, almost filigree work at the top, a decorative pattern, but that has been cut through uh, with a fine edged weapon. You see where the blade has stopped there. So this has probably been on the end of the scabbard alongside somebody's uh, lower leg and somebody's taken a swipe at it with a, with a sword and actually cut, cut the artefact through. And probably the chap's leg as well. Many of the finds are grim reminders of what men faced on the day of the battle. Yeah, this is, a, this is what a medieval bomber would have shot in the, in the heat of battle. So this particular arrowhead, and I could say for, for certain, has been stuck in a body and the body's rotted and the arrowhead's fallen out with a large number of other ones. From the recorded positions of the artefacts, Tim has been able to build up a detailed plot of exactly where the main contact areas were during the battle. It was the first survey of its kind in Europe and it enabled Tim to interpret the events of that day in 1461. It's difficult for us to imagine what a medieval battle was like. We're quite soft in the great scheme of things. We do not attack each other with big clubs or with big machete type implements. And so of course we grew up with a very safe feeling. But in the medieval period it was different. Medieval battles were relatively common, or medieval conflict was at least. So you've got the formal Lancashire army here, lined up behind us here. We've got the formal Yorkist army lined up on that ridge. The Yorkists slowly move forward, but in line. The battle began, with both sides unleashing thousands of arrows. Because the wind is in the Yorkist favour, when the Yorkists lose their arrows, they go further and actually manage to hit the Lancashire soldiers. The Lancastrians loose their arrows and because the wind's against them, all their arrows fall short. It's quite a major tactical achievement. If you can get your enemy to move away from their standing position, they're almost certainly going to lose. The Yorkists, they can stay put. The Lancastrians can either withdraw or they can attack. And at this point, they are numerically superior 
so they decide to attack. Now the Lancashians are moving off their fixed position and have to travel down the slope into the valley bottom to meet the Yorkists. And this is where they formally engage as two armies. The deadly stalemate continued until late in the day, Yorkist reinforcements arrived and tipped the balance against the Lancastrians. They finally broke and fled. The whole of the landscape is just full of people fleeing off the battlefield in all directions. Some people tried to get to Tadcaster, to the river crossing. Some people just tried to make it through all the marshes, across all the rivers. From here onwards, you're getting people being hacked down in the landscape. Everything was decimated. The people were being killed. The houses were being burnt. Everything was being looted. It's possible that the men buried in the mass grave were killed during the chaos and carnage of the rout. It was in this war-ravaged landscape that Richard's new chapel once stood. It's a huge area though, and trying to find buried remnants of a single building could be difficult. Tim's been surveying this landscape for years now, so with magnetometry and geophysics, he's gradually built up a picture of what lies beneath the surface. Matching this with documentary accounts, He's found that at the time the chapel was built, Richard III also sanctified this area of the battlefield. Some of the dead were cleared off the middle of the battlefield, again very soon after Richard became King of England. And he did that presumably to sanctify the ground, uh, take the burials off the unconsecrated ground of the battlefield and put them here in, in an area we know was consecrated ground because there was a chapel here before the Battle of Towton. Chapel Hill seemed at first to be the right place to look, but it turned out not to be as simple as that. So over the last 15 years, we've covered this whole field in geophysical survey and excavation. Importantly, we've excavated some of these features. So the whole of the top of Chapel Hill here has been excavated. We know that this is a plain field covered in medieval field systems and there's nothing that remains of a chapel or any structure out there. The only bit of Chapel Hill now that we haven't looked at intensively is inside the garden. L let's face it, this is the only place left where it can be. We've looked everywhere else. So if it's not here, then there's gonna be no trace of it. The area Tim's now focusing on is within the grounds of Towton Hall itself, known as Chapel Garth. It's worth a try. The hall wasn't built in 1461, but the site was in the battle area. The defeated Lancastrians almost certainly retreated through here. To help out, Tim has enlisted Helen Goodchild from the University of York. It's quite She'll nice carry out a ground penetrating radar survey to try yeah, and give an idea of there. where to dig. It's not the first time Tim has carried out archaeology at the hall. In 2002 and 2006, more burials were found. He and Simon dug beneath the building itself to recover the skeletons. Just like a, a, a forensic crime scene, you're trying to pick out little elements about how each person died or fought, but you're trying to do it on a massive scale where there could be hundreds or thousands of people doing exactly the same thing at the same time. It, it gives us a, a, an insight into the medieval mind, the medieval way of doing things, and also the, may or the way of medieval death. I think the important thing for me when we analyze for example, a medieval skeleton, is, is to give them something back. They have probably given everything they had for somebody else. At a moment's notice, in theory, your lord could come and say, right, excuse me, we're going to war. Drop your farm tools and off we go. And it was a, a, a rough existence for most people, actually. Still more burials were found under the driveway at the front of the hall. Throughout the project, 
Every skeleton was painstakingly removed and conserved by trained osteologists. Marlin Holst was there right from the start. At King's Manor, home to the University of York's Department of Archaeology, Marlin examines some of the skeletons. When we were excavating the grave, um, we were trying to unpuzzle every single skeleton and work out which bones belong to which skeleton. And the only reason that was possible because every single person on that site excavating that grave was a trained skeleton expert, an osteologist. The sheer number of skeletons in the pit made it hard to make sense of. The position of one created a misunderstanding about how the individuals may have been killed. It appeared as if one skeleton had the arms tied behind their back. And of course that had massive implications with regards to the interpretation of this grave. Because it suggested then that perhaps at least one, if not all of them, were prisoners. The interpretation that there were prisoners executed during or after the battle is a myth that's dogged the story of the excavations. Yet careful recording of each individual bone meant this could be disproved. This myth that had been created about this possible prisoner um, could be dispelled by the fact that um, we closely analysed the skeletons and we realised actually we'd recorded one arm twice and one of the arms of this individual that looked as if he'd had the arms tied behind his back, one of those arms actually belonged to somebody else and had therefore been recorded twice. So that myth was completely destroyed. Analysis showed them that almost every skeleton carried some evidence of violent injury. The grim reality of the medieval age of chivalry. The general opinion was that the Battle of Towton and probably all medieval battles were actually quite chivalrous and that um, they were very honourable and, and quite romantic in a way. It was quite shocking to a lot of people, the sort of gory facts that were revealed through our analysis that this wasn't chivalrous at all. It was a really bloody battle that people probably had that red mist effect where they couldn't exactly control what they were doing anymore. They weren't in charge exactly um, of what they were doing. Um, it, it was just hacking around one another. The four skeletons removed from beneath the dining room of Towton Hall showed the signs of a hard life spent soldiering. Most of the individuals who we've analysed from the Battle of Towton were aged usually between sort of 18 and 45. This individual here was buried in a grave on his own. Um, he's aged 36 to 45. What is obvious is that this person was quite fit and muscular as well. The men who fought the Battle of Towton were mostly in the prime of life, yet their bones carry physical evidence of violent death, often from multiple injuries. This individual has got six skull injuries, some of them as minor as this uh, superficial stab wound, but there's also, if you can see here, a triangular cross-section of a much more deep, penetrating um, stab wound. And then a large cut here, which you can see has entered this area. And all of these have caused fracture lines that are emanating from them. If you turn the skull around, you can see that there's another stab wound here and another cut wound here in this area. So this person had uh, a blow to the left side of the skull, uh, probably three stab wounds to the back of the st skull and one, two large cuts. Uh, to the s back and side of the skull as well.
some of the trauma marks are small and easily missed. But with careful analysis, it's possible for Marlin to interpret how they came about. So there are actually two parallel cuts into this pelvis. We've got a little mark here on the inside of the pelvis. And if we turn this bone over, we can see that there was probably a blade or perhaps even an arrow that went into the left side of the hip and um, penetrated the bone. More than one of the skeletons has unusual blade trauma to the jaw. This led again to interpretations that the men had been executed or finished off by having their throats cut. So this individual has actually also got a cut there on the jaw in exactly the same place as the previous skeleton, um, but a much deeper cut that's um, actually uh, come from the sort of front and the side, um, and then bone has splintered off upwards and downwards on the lower jaw. It's difficult to know how exactly this came about. There were many ways to get injured in a medieval battle. The other trauma this individual suffered is not as obvious as in the first skeleton. But he actually has just this area here which is affected, caused by, by a blunt instrument, um, and therefore the, just the impact through um, head protection. One of the skulls carries an injury that was evident straight away as it was excavated. It's one of the most horrendous found on all the Towton skeletons. This injury here was noted immediately on site um, during excavation when his skull was exposed. Um, it's a cut that's come from above and the left hand side of this individual and it actually ends here. So it was probably the tip of a sword which severed this person's lip um, and maxillary bone here and also his teeth. I think it must have come from the left side um, and above. Marlin also found that some injuries seem to have happened even without the impact of a weapon. These men may have led hard lives and been used to fighting, yet this didn't stop them experiencing terror in a battle like Towton. So this person has fractured the first molar in their mouth, and this has occurred before death. And when we spoke to soldiers who uh, would currently be um, fighting, they said that in the midst of battle they clenched their teeth um, to such a degree that it actually causes fracturing of the crowns of the teeth. Of these four skeletons, three had been buried together in a triple grave. It seems possible that brothers, sons, fathers or cousins may have faced battle together that day in the snow. These two individuals who are on this table and this individual here were together um, buried in a t triple get grave. And uh, it's quite interesting that these all three have got a minor genetic trait in common, and that's a little anomaly in the spine. Uh, the fact that these are all very, very similar could potentially suggest that they were related. Back at the hall, the remote survey around Chapel Garth is complete. The hunt for the chapel is proving more difficult than even Tim imagined. But the geophysical survey doesn't show anything that looks like buildings on this part of the hill. There's one last place he wants to look. The radar survey showed up a small anomaly under the garden at the front of the hall. Now, with all the other options exhausted, he tries one last throw of the dice. 
It's the only place it can be is very close to the Towton Hall, the present building. And so by carrying out the survey in the very close proximity to the hall, hopefully we'll find some evidence. The survey data shows what might be building remains, but they might also just be old flower beds. The only way to find out is to dig. Simon joins up again with Tim to help. They're working right by where some of the skeletons were found. Yeah, I worked on the battlefield for 35 years. Um, mostly metal detecting work, but I've done a few surveys with Tim, where we've dug test pits and uh, done some uh, magnetometer surveys. But it's just, it's just an area I love. It's not long before Simon begins finding rubble, which indicates building work at some stage in the hall's past. It looks like old features were removed and buried here, under what's now the front lawn. Everywhere we've dug, there is like a lens of this rubble material that's been spread over the whole site. Imagine a modern building site, what they do is they come in, they dig the foundation trenches, and anything that's around that they dig through to make the foundation trench, it just gets spread around on the surface. And then what they do is they put the modern building inside the foundation trench, the level is all off, and then they come around and they put it all in topsoil, so it looks pretty. So one of the demolition layers gets spread around the whole of the area of Towton Hall, and that includes some of the moulded plaster work from some of the ornate uh, rooms inside the, the hall, and then you'll get some um, right. stone work where they've knocked through walls or demolished you know walls that. and rebuilt them. And so you should get a bit of everything, really. So far, most of this seems to be either very early or 17th century, much later than a building of Richard III's time. Tim, have you got one minute, please, to have a look at this? Look at this. That really fine limestone block there. You see the tool marks on it, look. Yeah, that's nice. That's got 45 degrees and it's got a chamfered edge on there, look. See the chamfer? Yeah. That's yeah. really fine limestone. So... This is more of the stuff we're looking for. Yeah. The fact that it's squared off and it's been tooled. Uh, we're, it's more of the uh, the quality we're looking for. Early, but that's, that's that looks. We've got good. another block there as well. Look. That looks nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's really fine, is that? Man, it's it could not just been be finished, a has it? It's not been it's not been polished. They've still got the tooling marks going across there. So a chisel just goes like this and then they polish it until it gets like that so it's nice and smooth and they've taken all the tooler marks off. So we're getting some real good, different type of quality building material again. Yeah, definitely. Maybe the edge of a window sill. But that's without a nice piece of uh, tooled corner there. Excellent. Oh, God, he's still going down. Yeah. The stone fragments are the first real clues they've found. Evidence of what looks like a medieval building somewhere here. But with no foundations or walls still in situ, it's difficult to be sure. Could they be from Richard III's chapel? Where is Richard III's chapel? It's a very good point because it's somewhere tantalizingly close to this site. It's so close you can almost smell it because it's nowhere else. We've looked on top of the Chapel Hill, we've looked north and south, we've put test pits in, we've done geophysical survey. This is the only location where there are medieval buildings. The finds encouraged him to begin working out what form Richard's chapel might have taken. No illustrations or plans exist so to get an idea of what a 15th century medieval chapel built by a king might have looked like, Tim heads to Warwick. Richard Beesham, 13th Earl of Warwick, was one of the most powerful noblemen in England in the 15th century. After his death, the family memorialized him by building an entirely new chapel here in the Collegiate Church of St. Mary's. It's one of the most opulent chapels still surviving from the time of the Wars of the Roses. This was built just before the Battle of Towton and it's built over the period that, that encompassed the Battle of Towton. 
But one thing we don't know about the chapel at Town is how big it was. Was it, was it on this scale or was it significantly small or was it half as small or a quarter as small? Was it more of a private, little private chapel? So on one scale we've got this very large expansive building which is the Chantry Chapel but next to it and um, built on the side of it we've got what's known as the Dean's Chapel and th this is on the other scale and this is all you really need to say prayers for the dead the, the quality screams at you in which case we need to consider how this fits in with our story at town because obviously we've got what is essentially a royal chapel where Richard III commissioned the chapel at town are, are we expecting something along the size and scale of this here and it's almost inconceivable that something like this could disappear and nobody would ever see it again so is it considerably smaller we've got a very small private chapel attached to the Beecham Chapel here which is basically enough room for a priest to say prayers which is all you really needed if you are pr saying prayers for the dead continually which is what a, a, a chantry chapel is supposed to be all about so we've, we're somewhere between the two we've probably got a quite a large chapel somewhere at town that's disappeared but it's somewhere between this grand building and the little private chantry chapel there. To try to narrow it down between the two, Tim needs some expert advice. At King's Manor, Anthony Massington checks out the finds. He's a buildings archaeologist and specialises in the techniques and styles used in medieval stonemasonry. There were buildings at Towton earlier than the battle in 1461 and much later from the 17th century on. Richard III's prestigious chapel is known to have been started during his two-year reign from 1483 to 85. So Tim needs to date the stones to roughly the end of the 15th century. So are we talking post-medieval sort of Jacobean, early Jacobean, mm -hmm. or are we talking about a medieval, late medieval period? Yeah. And then we need sort of status. How good is the quality of this? Is it top quality, mm -hmm. medium, or pretty poor? So what do you reckon to that? In terms Straight of away, Anthony identifies the fragment. What is it for start? That's the jam of a window. So it's the vertical so it right be, on the side. Yeah, so it should be like... Should we, should the, should we that one? And I presume this is a glazing bar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's the glazing groove. The jam is the stone frame of the window. The glazing bars supported the leaded stained glass panels. It looks in keeping with a church, but one grand enough to have been built by a king? It's not peasant stuff. No, no this is, this quite, is quite really good. high status. This oh, is this, high status. Yeah, yeah, oh, this, is, this is very fine. I mean, it's, 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 it's finished really in a nice way. And um, yeah, you wouldn't get this except in a high status building. Excellent, and is it? Right. High status fits with the kind of sumptuous chapel Richard III may have built, but can it be dated to the right period? And this sort of chamfer style is current from the end of the 13th century all the way to the mid-16th. It's a really broad range. Tim needs to narrow it down. Maybe some of the other pieces can help. That's good news. Yeah, so that yeah. would tie that in in theory. Uh, let's go on to one of the other major ones. So, for example, this one. This is a mullion in a window. So this is the stone bit that goes straight up and down. The central part, or yep. one yep. of the central parts. Exactly. So you have a big opening for a window, and then that's divided up by stone bits into individual lights in a window. In the medieval period, stained glass panels were usually fairly narrow, because otherwise the soft leading would bow under the weight. Mullions strengthened the windows and divided the glass. I mean, you've got glass here and glass here, but we don't know if you had another one over here and over here to make it a really wide window. We can't tell from yep. this one piece. Yeah. So the molding profile here is this diamond pattern. Mm -hmm. And that diamond pattern um, is most common in the 15th century. Again, this pattern does sort of appear in the 13th and the 14th, but really its heyday is the 15th century. So that is a very and good And the quality sign. of this is 
Good. It's a beautiful quality. Excellent. It's fine right. quality. It's, it's really finished off well. So it's not particularly fancy in terms of its ornamentation of right. its molding profile. But when they finished it, they finished it very nicely. So they're all high quality. It's not just any old stonework that's been no. thrown up into a building. This no, is good no, stuff. No, this is very Excellent. good stuff. Yeah. The fragments seem to fit with a building of the chapel status. And Anthony can detect more clues from their condition. Chris, I mean, this is as nice as the day it came off the sort of, you know, the day the mason finished with it. Yes. And then they put this nice, lovely, very thin skim on so that it could either be just stand there and be white to be very nice or be, um, or be painted. So this is the side that's being presented to people inside. Right. Whereas if you uh, look on this side... That's interesting then. That's definitely rougher, isn't it? This I is mean, much rougher. This has been sitting outside for a little while. If this is Richard's Chapel, then this was built in 1483, 1484. Mm -hmm. There's much evidence here that indicates that it's absolutely of that time. The evidence points to the right date. Now can they back this up with anything about the shape or style of the window? I would initially have said this is a corner of a window sill, and this is the inside. I, you can't tell if this is necessarily a head or a sill. If, without finding a piece of stonework that has a, a slight curve to it, you, you're not going to be able to Well, tell that's when I might be able to help you, because <laughs> there is this one, I mean, we're talking about very, very slight Tiny curving. Curve. That's the only bit of curve that Let's I can find anywhere in any of this. No, my initial feeling on this one is that that's been cut that way. Right. That's tooled oh. off. Because I, I think I'm seeing a little bit of tooling. And then we right. can tell but that you may be that a, a part of the upper the, the upper framework of a, of yeah. a curved window. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's right. so nicely finished here that I, I'm pretty sure that's intentional. The fragment seems to hint at arches, though just how tall or wide the whole window was can't be judged without more evidence. But there's one more thing Anthony can tell. These fragments aren't reused. So this is primary rubble. This is, this is primary and it's, and it's not been reused. Primary 15th century stonework. Not broken up for walls or infill, nor as weathered as might be expected if it had stood for hundreds of years in the elements. Tim begins to suspect what might have happened to the chapel. I'm pretty certain that this ties into a period of the hall when it was renovated in the 19th century. Uh, now this is the tricky bit, because this suggests that somewhere there was an upstanding chapel that was renovated and knocked down in the 19th century. We don't have that, so we've got a problem there. Unless, of course, we're talking about a building that just got buried within another building. Is that possible? Those sorts of buildings are really ephemeral and they get repurposed and then once they get repurposed, fragments of them can hang around for centuries and bits of them will come out as a building gets renovated. So it's entirely, entirely possible that in somewhere in the core of the present building, you've got the chapel. Towton Hall first appeared sometime in the 17th century. Then it was changed and expanded over the years into its current form. If it were built over a chapel, you'd expect it to follow the normal church alignment east-west. Yet that isn't the case here. The other problem that I've got is the orientation of the present hall is distinctly north-south. Again, what frequently happens is that when a building is repurposed after the sort of Reformation period, their focus literally gets shifted around. So if you've got a chapel, then frequently what will happen is that the building will start to sort of grow off of that east, west, north, south. And then if you happen to sort of leave a little bit sticking out, it's very common that in renovation, they'll just lop that off and suddenly turn an east, west building into a north, south building. If the chapel somehow survived, still standing within the footprint of what's now Towton Hall, then where is it? Tim goes back to the evidence of the mass graves and the other burials around the hall. Maybe they can help him find the chapel. If I didn't know the sort of when those burials were from, mm -hmm. I would say that those burials are younger than the house. Yes. Because they're in alignment with the house. Yes. Now the burials would have been put in alignment with any sort of chapel that would be on this site. I've never seen a building follow a burial's alignment, a skeleton's alignment, but I've seen lots of buildings following the alignment of an older building that they're building on top of. 
the three things that leapt out at me when I looked at this plan. The first thing is that the house respects the alignment of the burials. Mm, yes. And, and that means I think the house's alignment is preserving the memory of the, whatever building was formerly on this site, which is common. I mean, it, that happens when they convert these spaces. I would put the chapel in this region. In the central block. In the central block, yeah, in the central block. And like you said, I mean, e either the house is built and it butts up, the earliest house is built and it butts up against the chapel, so you may have a west wall of the chapel here, or the house just encased the earlier chapel. Or, I mean... Anthony's interpretation fits with Tim's research. After the battle, the landscape was sanctified. Many of the dead, hundreds, perhaps thousands, were recovered from the fields around town. With due care, they were reburied in the consecrated ground of Richard III's chapel. As the centuries passed, Towton Hall grew around it until the chapel itself was gradually hidden within. It's not on Chapel Hill, it's not in the gardens, it's not around the hall, it's actually partially inside the hall and therefore the evidence we've been looking for is actually inside all the data that we already had, all the, yes. you know, the hall buildings. Mm -hmm. So for the last 15 years we've been looking for something and it's been there in the one location yeah. where there is still a standing structure. Yeah. So this answers one of the main questions about where Towton Chapel went to. The fact is it didn't go anywhere. It's still it's there. It's still there. Still inside the hall. Yeah. That is unbelievable. So that's 15 years of work. <laughs> You've learned a lot about the context though. Exactly. It, so it's, now it's we know the fruitful. landscape it's in and this is the, at the moment the summation of all this evidence. So it really does tie into the fact yeah. that it's a Richard's Chapel is now possibly still existing to a small or greater degree in and around uh, Towton Hall. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're That's very been welcome. absolutely fantastic. The years of careful detective work have paid off. It seems likely now that Richard III's chapel, so long lost to history, may have been there all the time. I've been looking for the chapel for so long. It was one of the primary objectives of starting the whole of this project off. It was the story that motivated a lot of people. This was the missing chapel of Richard III. In all the places where we've looked, this was probably the last place we'd actually consider finding it. It's actually structurally standing still there, inside another building. More than five and a half centuries later, the memory of Towton lingers in the Yorkshire fields and in their many thousands, lost within sight of York's great minster, the dead still lie.